Thank you very much, uh, Catherine, for having me uh, come today. And again, Jan, thank you for uh, making this happen. And, and, uh, and for Mark and for Roth, thank you for making me look good and sound good today. I, so uh, it is an honor to be here today and to share with you. And so what I think we'll do is I'll talk for about 20 minutes and then we'll have about five minutes of questions. And so we just have a little discussion for about five minutes. And then I'll go for another 20 minutes and then we can have more questions and discussion. But about 10 minutes to, to one, I will formally end our time together. Sometimes we just feel a bit uncomfortable just getting up and leaving. And so, but then we'll just continue visiting together and chatting. So that's how we're going to go for uh, our hour together today. So thank you very much for just to be able to be here. And uh, so what I do in part um, is mentoring. And I like to think, that there's three formations that go into mentoring. Like as I, as I walk beside a person from where they are now to where they want to be. That's what I imagine mentoring to be. And it focuses on three formations. One is knowledge. So what is the knowledge that you need to go from here to there? Let's suppose that five years from now, there's a door that you want to have opened. What's the knowledge that you need? What are the skills that you need? in a sense, to have that door open five years from now. And, but the third area is the person, you yourself. And that focuses on such things as character, personality, relationships, emotional health, uh, and then uh, core values, leadership, and then self-management as well. And today we're gonna focus on core values um, and the relationship of core values to our own personal journeys and by extension, because we're all leaders, by extension, the cultures that we work in as leaders. And uh, I did notice uh, uh, Wednesday evening when I came in that out on the front, you have three core values uh, written there on the front of the building. And those three buildings, uh, those three words are collaborate, innovate, and grow. And had I known that this was on the front of the building, I could have shaped my talk around it. Uh, today, we will focus on the second and third, and another word for innovate is the word creativity. And so the second part of my talk today, we're going to be focused on creativity and uh, growth. Well, that's uh, obviously very important. In my cynical, darker moments, I have this expression, everyone can grow, most don't. Um, collaboration, of course, is the, on, on teams. I won't probably have much to say on that uh, today. But these are core values. And uh, we're going to look at the role that core values play within our own lives and then how these core, core values then shape the cultures where we work. So, Catherine, I do hope you will forgive me for this. Uh, but I want to talk about Hewlett and Packard for a few minutes. Uh, but being here today, I've learned a lot about your culture, and I wish I could have accessed uh, some of this information earlier. I could have actually uh, used what you guys are trying to do here. Um, I found this very interesting, and that is this. In the 1990s, that's the most recent statistic I could get, 95% of middle and senior leaders at HP had engineering and science degrees, 95%. I sent out a few emails to a number of my students from, like, that I work with from all over the world. In every culture around the world, there's a stereotype that engineers make horrible bosses. Well, I'd like to think that maybe that HP statistics is suggests something different. 95% of middle and senior leadership at HP had engineering and science degrees. So David Packard and Bill Hewitt, um, when I read their book, The HP Way, that 95% made perfect sense to me. These two guys, both engineers, by the way, and apparently both very good engineers, back in the 1930s, decided to create a company, and they brought to that company their core values. So you can read about these core values in that wonderful little book, The HP Way. And these core values then shaped the leadership culture of HP. 
They shape the leadership culture, and then by extension, the entire culture of HP. Core values in individuals extend to leadership cultures and then extend to the culture as a whole. I really like what Bill Hewlett said. Um, our policy flows uh, from the belief that men and women want to do a good job, a creative job. Now, for the word creative here, we can take that word innovative on the front of the building and put it right there, because creative and innovative are the same word. People want to do a creative job, an innovative job, and that if they're provided with the right proper environment, with the right proper environment, they will do so. They will do so. So I'll come back to that word creative in the second part of my talk today, but for now I want to talk about that word proper environment, which of course includes the, the, the leadership culture, say here at Samsung or at HP or any company, and it's just like what David Hewlett and Bill Packard said, leadership extends who we are. Leadership extends who we are. What we are on the inside shows itself in how we lead on the outside. The only people in this room today who will disagree with me are those who've always had great bosses. If you've had a horrible boss at some point in your life, you will agree. <laughs> Leadership, who we are on the inside, shows itself in how we lead on the outside. And so if I'm a mess inside emotionally, if I'm a mess inside, this is gonna come out in how I lead others. So take, take anger, for example. If I have a lot of anger and resentment inside me, it's coming out. So imagine that I'm the boss and Someone wants to come to me with some information. If they know that I am an angry man, that I can get angry, and anger actually is a very good emotion. I like to think of my, our, my emotions as my best friend. My emotions love me very much, but there can be a, a dark, toxic side to anger. If that person has to, in a sense, do this, how should I say it so that Ken doesn't get upset. If I have to figure out how am I going to say it? See, I want to create a safe environment where you could come to me and you don't have to worry how you're going to say it. So when someone's in my office and I sense that they're worried, I will just say this. Don't worry how to say it. Just say it. We'll figure out later how to say it. Who I am on the inside shapes all my relationships and how I lead. Now, walking a path of emotional health is very important. I wrote a book on that, um, like for our own self-leadership and then for leading others. But today, what I want to focus on is core values. And the best way to learn on terms of how core values work in our lives is just to give some examples. And uh, so what I want to do is look at some of my core values, big and small. So we'll start with a small one. And that's the core value of over-communication. And the basic idea is this, over-communicate rather than under-communicate. So I constantly do this. So I can use Jan as an example because uh, we're friends, but I'm also her mentor. And uh, I frequently come across information that I think may be of useful to Jan. Even though we're good friends, and I know a fair bit about her, I don't know everything she knows. And I've thought to myself, I might annoy her right now by sending her something, but I don't know if she knows it or not. I would rather err on over-communication rather than under-communication, even if that meant annoying you once in a while because I've just sent you some information that, oh, I already knew this, okay? I'm I don't want to annoy anybody and irritate them, but then I think to myself, let's say I decide not to send this information, and it was valuable to them, but they didn't get it. Why didn't you tell me? Have you ever said that to someone? <laughs> Why didn't you tell me? We can flip this right upside down, all right? 
Um, a moment ago, I, uh, I spoke about, like with Bill Hewlett and David Packard, that uh, shared their organizational culture um, there at HP. And, uh, but another way to, sh to shape a, a healthy culture is solving one problem at a time. Yes, we can shape a healthy culture by, in a sense, bringing our core values uh, to that culture, but a culture can also be changed by solving problems. It is so frustrating when there's a problem, and let me pause for a moment, there's a problem. For the most part, would you agree with this? That all big problems generally started as little problems but they were ignored. The information did not get to the right person who could talk about it and deal with it. I tell people, only complain to somebody who can do something about it. Only, ranting, by the way, does no good. We all think it does. I just got to rant to get this off my chest. Well, it actually makes us worse. A man who's five out of 10 angry rants, he's, he'll become a seven out of 10 angry man ranting, in the, it makes you feel good in the, in the short term, it makes you far worse in the long term. Rant to the person who can do something about it. We can change cultures one step at a time by solving problems one step at a time. And, and in leadership, how many times I say, well, why didn't you tell me? Okay, you don't want to deal with the problem? Fine, you don't have to, but bring the problem to me. I'll deal with it. I have the authority to deal with it. Okay, I over-communicate because I see the problems and consequences that come from under-communication. Yes, I don't want to annoy Jan or anybody else, but I've made the choice. Over-communication has no downside at all. So the core value of over-communication. Now we come to the core value uh, of, of excellence. Okay, oh, there's that slide. Solving problems one problem at a time shapes a healthy organizational culture. Uh, my question, did big problems usually start out as little problems? And the answer is yes. And uh, so we come down to the core value of excellence. And I'll come to that slide uh, in a moment. Um, but I just want to say this by way of introduction. Excellence is not perfection. It's not perfectionism. I won't get into it at all. But pursuing excellence is a good thing. Pursuing, per pursuing perfection or perfectionism is a very bad and dark thing. So I remember the day that I resolved to pursue excellence. So I was 25 years of age, and I was tired of being good. I was tired of being good at school, good at sports, good at music, good at everything. I was tired of being good. And on a specific day, and I can still remember it, I decided from now on I'm going to pursue excellence in what I do. And the first thing that meant was saying no to things. Because if you want to excel, you can't do everything and focus more on a few things. So this is what I have found in pursuing excellence as a way of life, as a core value. Pursuing excellence has never been difficult or a sacrifice. Secondly, it has made my life simpler. It's made me teachable. Because I'm always trying to find, even though you pursue excellence, you still want to find the fastest way to do it. Um, so I'm always constantly learning. It helped me to see where my strengths lie, where my passions lie. And pursuing excellence brings me joy. Now, I don't want to say that my experiences with any of my core values will be the same as yours. But a great way to learn together is to listen to each other and to learn from each other's experiences. So don't think for a second that your experience with a core value would be the same as mine. But we can learn from each other and walk together as we grow. Now for what I'm going to say now, I could say it in my own words, but I wanna put a plug in for a little book that I just think is absolutely wonderful, and it's this book, uh, Creativity Inc. by Ed Catmull. Ed Catmull was the president of uh, Pixar Animation just up the road from here, and. Uh, then Disney decided, we like the leadership culture at Pixar, so let's go buy Pixar and uh, take over their leadership culture. So Ed, Ed Catmull is now the president of both Disney and, uh, I mean, Disney and Pixar animation. And he said this, 
I could say it too, it is unthinkable that we not do our best. Once, once you have that core value of excellence, it is just simply unthinkable that we not do our best. But let me just add one more thing here, uh, and it's to state the obvious. Pursuing excellence does not mean pursuing excellence in everything. We need wisdom on when to give it an A job and when to give it a B job. It takes wisdom to discern when we give a job our full and when we, this doesn't need my full, okay? And I learned this little principle years ago and I just love it. And yeah, don't, don't use it yourself, you might get in trouble, but it's the principle of planned neglect. Some things you just have to plan to neglect them. Okay, so uh, we pursue excellence, but uh, sometimes we just have to, we're not going there. Okay, so how then do uh, core values work? How do core values work? Um, we could talk at length for the, about this, but everything influences everything because everything is connected. So my core values shape other core values. They shape my emotions. My emotions shape my core values, my behavior. Everything about us is connected. And it's quite awesome just the way the brain works. So chapter two of my book, even though I wrote it so that a 16-year-old can understand it, I did a lot of research in what's now called effective neuroscience just to see how the brain processes emotions and what we can expect from our emotions. For example, never ever say to yourself or to someone else, do not fear. It is impossible for the brain not to fear. It's impossible. You're basically forcing the brain to do something it's not designed to do. Fear is a healthy, normal emotion. Just the way the brain works, everything about us is connected, and it's literally quite awesome. So I wrote that chapter based on effective neuroscience, but I wrote it with, so that a 16-year-old can understand it. And uh, so it, it was one of my most enjoyable chapters uh, to read. So everything's connected. So let's take Jack and Diane. Now, that's not the two from the heartland, if you know that song. So if you're as old as me, you know the song. Okay, there's a two, these two people grew up around here. And Jack and Diane have marriage problems. And they've had marriage problems for some time. So Diane is always wanting to get Jack to talk about their problems. So she's ang okay, So in a situation like this, what, what emotions are coming up are, well, she's angry, she's frustrated, she's disappointed. Uh, so she's got all these emotions going on inside of her, and she's also angry and upset and disappointed because Jack doesn't want to talk about the problem. So the problems make her angry and disappointed, and him not wanting to talk about it makes, him makes her angry and disappointed. Time goes on, and eventually Diane gets to the point where she doesn't feel anything. Good thing, bad thing. When you don't feel, you don't care. In other words, Diane got to the place where she just didn't care anymore. So I imagine they'd get a divorce at that time. All right. I imagine they would get a divorce. Everything about us is connected. Our emotions, our core values. See, early on in the relationship for Diane, she cared. She wanted to have a healthy relationship. And when she didn't get that, and when Jack didn't want to talk to her about that, her emotions were signaled. Anger and frustration and disappointment. But our core values read our emotions. They read our behavior, and then eventually they change, and she gets to the point where she just doesn't care anymore, and when you don't care, you don't feel. When you don't care, you don't feel. Everything about us is connected. We strengthen core values. This is actually quite easy. We strengthen core values by doing them over and over again, and the more we do it, this is the wonderful thing, the more we do it, the easier it gets. It takes no effort now for me to live excellence as a way of life. It takes no effort for me to over-communicate. Change eventually becomes easy. So today we're focusing on positive core values, but there's negative ones too. 
And we witness these, unfortunately, way too often in leadership. So have you ever had a boss who lied about you, put you down, made you look bad? The psychology is actually quite simple here. Uh, and that is on the next slide. Um, unfortunately, English does not have a word for this, but in German, they have Schadenfreude, joy at the suffering of others. Um, I'm not even going to begin to uh, pronounce the Chinese word, which is there for those who can read Chinese. English, unfortunately, we don't have a word. So we have to settle for phrases and quotations. And I love this one by Gore Vidal. It is not enough that I succeed. Others must fail. We have leaders who have this as a core value. They'll be so sweet in the meeting to you, but you know, the knife behind, to make them look good, they have to make you look bad. If you have not had a leader like this or a boss like this, I hate to say it, just be patient. A leader from hell is coming your way. <laughs> so thank you for laughing. What I'd like to do now is that take, we'll take five minutes, and if you have any questions or comments, we'll take them in five minutes sharp. I will uh, pick up. If there's none, I'll just continue now. But uh, any questions or thoughts? Please, if you could stand up, or there was the mic, yeah. Excellent. Is, okay, well, to give a proper, yes, a very good question. Um, to, to, an, okay, to answer it properly, what I would need to do is sit down for a few minutes and we talk. But so, this is how I work with this, um, and that is, you st I still got to hold on to the principle. So if I'm going to err, I'm going to err on that side, because there's no perfection, right? Okay. The thing is, though, I hate email. All right, I literally hate it. I will never send an email unless I have to. So I'm evaluating the content. Okay, and I believe in short emails. Okay, which means you write the email and then you edit it in half. <laughs> okay, like keep it as short as possible. Good point. I would just say we have to just navigate what's important, what's not. I have found this uh, very beneficial, and I'm not the only one. Like Steve Jobs was excellent at this. Other leaders were like this as well. When you're in an office setting, I will always go and talk to you personally instead of sending an email if there's no paper trail required. But if I just need to give you a piece of information, I will come and talk. And it's a way just to build relationship and because this is the collaboration team aspect as well. I would say this, um, and I do this myself, is maybe keep a little notepad in your computer or something where you just keep a little journal. Just It doesn't take more than a few minutes now and then just to do a bit of reflection. And then when you get together with your team, you could say, this is a bit of a concern, and then as a team, you own the problem. And maybe that would be, yes? Jack and Diana. Okay, um, well, thank you very much. Um, think of core values, not, now they get very solid within us the more we enforce them. Like, it, it, they, 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 they become very strong. But let me, like, 
from that slide, core values also team up with other core values, okay? It's impossible for me to, love, to lie to my best friend. It's impossible. I could never lie to my best friend because this is where love and truth are coming together. It's impossible. Now, let's say I did lie. I would feel truckloads of guilt. Truckloads of guilt because my emotions are saying you violated two core values. The thing is, once you've lied once, the next time you make a decision, it can be a tiny bit easier. And then it gets a bit easier, and then it gets a bit easier. And that's why today is the most important day to be fully present in terms of how we make decisions in terms of core values. Because when we make the right decision today, our core values can strengthen. But then if we make other decisions, our core values can weaken to the point where Diane just didn't care. Unfortunately, I need, we need to, just very briefly, and then I'll go back, go, go ahead. Yes. Well, this is where emotional health and 100%. Um, I always want, in a sense, to be careful how I say it. But I do want to say it. I want to say it even when I know this information. And that's why you focus first on the relationship. You build a trusting relationship. So if I could just use the word again, like on a team, you know I love you. You know I love you. And it's in that context that I'm actually sharing this. Okay. Like I had to fire somebody once. It was after a long process of trying to get the behavior to be changed. The thing is, though, sometimes we do have to also make hard, right decisions. Okay. Yes. I'm, I'm very sensitive, though, to... Uh, <laughs> I want to make sure that they hear this and not put up a wall. So, okay. What I want to do for the next uh, few minutes is talk about the core of... Oh, so that's how they all work. Everything's influenced. I want to talk about creativity, which is your word for innovation. And I grew up believing that creativity is a gift, that you either had it or you did not. And since I did not have it growing up, I did not develop creativity. But then about 10 years ago, I was mentoring someone formally, and uh, this person I considered to be creative, and I decided at that moment, I'm going to make cre creativity a core value in my life. Just made the decision. I had no idea what I was committing myself to 10 years ago. But let's say this. I wish that I had made this commitment 20 to 30 years earlier. And I would love this to happen. After hearing our talk together today, if you decided today, I'm gonna make, core, I'm gonna make the core value of creativity a core in my life, I don't know where it's gonna go. 20, 30 years from now, you can think back and say, there was this guy who came to Samsung on this Friday in April, and he challenged me, encouraged me to adopt creativity as a core value and my life has never been the same since because it's never been the same for me either. I, I can't recommend this life enough. Right, so I'm just suggesting go for it, okay? I'm now convinced after being on this journey for about 10 years, there's no such thing as a gift of creativity. Whether that gift is given by God or by our genes, I don't believe there's any such thing anybody can develop creativity because the threads that go into being creative are available to all of us. So imagine that your life is a tapestry and imagine that creativity are the threads that we can weave into the tapestry of our lives. These threads are entirely within our control. And it doesn't happen by itself. So the first thread is the thread of mastery. So whether it be electrical engineering, guitar, or mathematics, if you want to be creative, it requires considerable, extensive learning of the discipline, of learning and skills. 
The funny thing is, though, there's this idea out there that formal learning, that extensive learning, say in your domain, it can poison your creative abilities. Artists often feel this way, that, you know, if I really learn this, it'll get in the way of my creativity. Um, you know what the thing is? The truth is the exact opposite. If we want to think outside the box, we have to thoroughly understand the box. What poisons creativity is suppressing curiosity, playing it safe, letting our fears win. So when you see this word innovate on the front of the building, think of this. I work at Samsung and we are mega curious. We don't play it safe. And we don't ever let our fears win. That's what poisons creativity. So I'm a writer, and, uh, and one of the tools that I use, of course, is language. And uh, it's, it's boring and dull, but to be a good, effective writer, you have to learn grammar and syntax. How words work, how phrases work, and how they all relate to another, like punctuation. The wonderful thing about learning language, though, is, is once you know the language, you can break it to your heart's content, all the rules. Uh, because language serves me, I don't serve language. But it take, took thorough understanding of language for me to become a better writer. The thing is, it's tedious and boring, and that's just part and parcel of what we do. We have to master a domain. Some of it we're gonna love. We, we happy to stay reading till two in the morning this stuff, but some of it is tedious and boring, and we still have to go there. Um, now, for me, like, I do love doing research. I'm one of those people, I can do research every single day for the rest of my life, and I just get energized by it, and I love it. But I also recognize that some research can be very boring and tedious. What I'm going to say now, I think is the most important thing about this, and I'm not the only one. If you read literature on creativity, everybody is saying this, that creativity happens when, in a sense, we, we focus in our main area, but we also step out of our area into another area. You've all had education, so think of it this way. You major in one area, and you have a minor in another area. It's cross-fertilization. And this cross-fertilization, where in a sense you, you live in two worlds, of course your major world, that's where you really focus, but this, what's going on in this other world can then influence that world. Essential to creativity is not living in a silo. We need, in a sense, to be in that silo, to master the field, but we also need to be out on the farm as well. Cross-fertilization. Um, in the question time after, if one of you wanted to ask me, well, can you show me how that looks in your life? I, I'll, I'd love to tell you how this has worked itself out in my life in terms of what I'm planning to do in the future. Um, Cross-fertilization, it's part of mastering the field. Second is the thread of grind or perseverance. And this one goes in hand in hand with the first, of course. Creativity requires persistent, persistent tenacity, dogged endurance, and grit. So a girl who's learning to play the piano, she grinds away, gets up, plays two to three hours every single day, disciplining herself, growing and growing, setting the highest expectations for herself and practices no matter how she feels. People with the core value of creativity do not sit around and wait until they feel creative. We just grind away. We climb over high walls of disappointment, discouragement. We navigate around 10,000 obstacles. We grind. So people listen to the music of Mozart. So if you love Mozart, think of the, think, think of the opening overture of the, the, the Marriage of Figaro or Don Giovanni. Uh, incredibly beautiful music. And people in Mozart's time thought that Mozart was blessed with a God-given gift. And that explains why Mozart can write such incredibly beautiful music and appear 
to do it effortlessly. This is how he responded. People err who think my art comes easily to me. I assure you, dear friend, nobody has devoted so much time and thought to composition as I do. Creativity requires grind, grind, perseverance, endurance. I don't give you some God-given gift. I give you Mozart, who worked hard to do it. If I could just turn aside for a second. Um, I used to be a bit of a musician, and uh, I have no talent, though. But I worked hard and worked hard and hard. So my son, um, he started listening to this band called U2, and instantly he loved guitar. And so he, he, I had a Les Paul. So he, he took my Les Paul, and I kid you not, in one week he was a better guitarist than I ever was. But natural talent is a total waste of time, and I mean that, unless you have this grit and determination. Without the grit and determination, no matter how much natural talent you have, it's never enough. It just isn't. So we come now to the thread of loving it. So some people discover their passions early on, and uh, other people it takes years. Uh, the phrase I love is to clear away the clouds. Like in mentoring people, a big thing that I do is help a person just clear away the clouds and see what they're passionate about, what they love to do, so that they, in a sense they can do the life that they really want to do that's inside them now. It's in there. But there's so much clutter in our lives. Clutter, clear away the clouds. We clear away the clouds so that we can see what we're truly passionate about and what we love. People with the core value of creativity act creatively because they love it. Yes, it takes hard work, but it's also lots of fun. And this has been my experience. Creativity performs joyfully. Creativity performs joyfully. That's an emotion. Secondly, love puts creativity into motion. If I love someone, I'm always looking for creative ways to express my love for that person. And that's the same for my writing, for my mentoring, for whatever I do. Now, I, do, I want to just add one more little thing here, and that is this. Usually, ability and love go hand in hand. Like, if you're really good at something, you usually love it. But it's not always the case. Okay, can, I, can I just say this? I've yet, to, I've yet to meet someone in the world who's better at admin than I am. That's probably not true, but I mean, I'm very good at admin. But do you ever pluck the ears out of your hair, out of your ear? You know how painful that is? That's what admin is like for me. None of you have ear hair, eh? I'm not getting any response, okay? <laughs> Admin is like pulling hair, like pulling ear hair for me. I get no energy, I don't get energized by it. No, another person may and, and will, but admin, I just, I, you have to do it any type of program in any type of business, any type of anything. We need to be good at admin. And I teach a lot of basic self-management skills so pe we can be more efficient at it. But it brings me no joy even though I'm excellent at it. And, uh, I don't know why I'm excellent at it, but uh, anyways, sometimes I wish I'm not because then people bring you things to do and it's like, why are you bring it to me? Well, you're good at it. Well, you don't need to bring it to me. <laughs> okay. If you're going to live the core value of creativity, you will fail. It is inevitable. Try something new and you will fail. And you will fail repeatedly. And it gets worse. <laughs> Failure happens when we put everything into it. 
in the slide, I, I don't know what happened to it, but that slide was right in the middle and I separated that sentence from everything else. Failure happens when we put everything into it. And that's why failure can be such a harrowing nightmare because creativity expresses who we are. It expresses who we are, what we value, and what we love. And so if we're working to create a leadership culture or a team culture that values creativity or the word on the front, innovation, to be innovative, what you're doing is you're shaping a culture that gives people freedom to fail. You can't be creative without failure. Now, there's three things that I found helpful or valuable in managing failure. Because I'm walking a path of creativity, which means I fail, and I do. One, when we fail, take full responsibility for the failure. Take full responsibility, no covering things up, no excuses. Because when we cover things up, when we cover our failures up, it usually just makes things worse and drags things out. Take full responsibility. Second, as uncomfortable as this is, and as, so it's emotionally difficult to do what I'm gonna say right now, what you do is you do an autopsy. You know, like in the morgue at the hospital, they do autopsies. I know it's a, it's a gruesome word, but it's the perfect word for this. You do an autopsy of the failure. I have learned so much about leadership by observing my failures, and of course through books, learning about and observing the failures of others. There's so much we can learn from basically studying thoroughly why we failed, what went wrong. This can be very painful because I put myself out there, this is me and I failed. You know what the wonderful thing is though? And this is truly wonderful that once we've done that, we usually want to share it with others. See, when we don't do that, we want to cover it up and keep it secret. But once we've learned so much, we come to the place and realize, you know, maybe some other people could learn from this too. And that often happens, that once you've done a thorough autopsy of the failure, you want to tell others. The third thing is very simple, very quick, fail quickly. Fail quickly. Like, fail and then pick yourself up and get on with it, and get on with it. So there's are some things that I do, and maybe they'll be benefit to, to you as well. So, uh, oh, there's the slide right there. So right the middle, I'll repeat it. Failure happens when we put everything into it, and now we come, oh, I want courage. So there's number five, courage. Um, to, live creativity, to live creatively, basically takes a lot of courage, sometimes lots of courage. Now, thankfully, courage is like muscles in our body. The more we act courageously, the more creative we get. So a core value out on the sign is grow. What, you, what, what Samsung is basically saying by this is that uh, we're in the business of encouraging people to be courageous and grow. So what I want to do now is share with you something that I've done, and with this then we'll close for today. I picked it up from a book a number of years ago, and I do this, and I do it almost every day, in big and little ways, okay? So if one or two of you start to do this, your life will never be the same again. The basic idea is go left, when you normally go right. Go left when you normally go right. So what I'm fighting against is what Ed Catmull says, the eternal impediment to our progress, the human resistance to change. Go left when you normally go right. So I'm constantly faced with decisions, big and little, and it's like it's right there in front of me, and I'm thinking, this is an opportunity to go left when I go right. So even with the little things, okay, like at the gym, I'm working out. Oh, I'm going to try a new apparatus today. I'm in my routine, though, so I have my routine at the gym, and I'm comfortable in that routine. 
but no, let's, let's get out of that routine and do some new apparatus or something. It takes a bit of courage even to change my routine at the gym, even though it's a tiny little thing, but I'm always happy afterwards and I feel great and it was fun. It's a lot more challenging in big things in life. I'm 59 years of age and I'm on a path of change and growth and I ain't stopping. And I need, though, to be courageous for those big decisions in my life. Because this is what I've found. When I'm walking beside a person, when I'm mentoring them, you clear away the clouds, and it becomes clear to the person, this is the path I'm meant to walk. In a sense, it's my calling, it's my vocation. They know it. I didn't have to tell them that. It's inside them. It's inside them. And you know what? The majority of people, even with knowledge, don't do it. The majority of people, they have the knowledge. They know the path that they should walk and want to walk. It's inside them, but they don't do it. Knowledge is never enough. Knowledge never changes the world. What we need is courage.